Okay, well, um, let's move on. Let's just discuss some of those themes from those two opening sessions. I think Natalie set the scene perfectly. I love the idea of the Mexican wave of biotech coming through and the desire for more collaboration. And I think, uh, you know, clearly Eric, with the views, particularly from a UK perspective, about demonstrating value within the NHS. Um, so we've got a great panel now to look at what disruption means and how different parts of the value chain are, are navigating that disruption. Um, I'm Joe, Joe Pisani. I lead uh, PwC's Pharma and Life Sciences consulting team in the UK. And I've been consulting to pharma companies for almost 20 years now on strategy. And, you know, we used to do, years of you have been to business school will know about the PEST framework, political, economic, social, I might test you, no, technology. <laughs> And I think it's quite fascinating. If I park political for the moment, which was always the one which always said about stable political risk, and let's worry about that. Clearly with economic, we've got the requirement to demonstrate value, particularly in, uh, in cash-strapped healthcare economies. And as Eric said, healthcare costs as a percentage of GDP are rising rapidly through that. Um, the social aspects, the empowered patient, and again, I think Eric um, ex explained very eloquently the, the, the needs to capture the patient voice and engage with patients in a, in a very different way, and therefore the need of things like the ABPI code potentially to adapt as well. And then technology, digital data analytics. I was uh, with Jim Sullivan the other day from AbbVie where he called it the sixth modality in terms of pharma research, which is absolutely fascinating, but also cell and gene therapy. And let's not forget, with those sorts of new technologies, you've got new entrants coming in, particularly the big tech players. So think Google, Apple, Amazon, those sorts of players coming into that environment. So very, very, a lot of change there. As I mentioned, we used to park political risk as being relatively stable, but let's look at it. We've currently got the B word, Brexit, which I'm sure we'll have a lot of discussion here today. Also Trump with tax reforms, and you might have seen that last year, really re reducing the level of corporate tax from 38.9% to 25.7% for US corporate tax, which means there's only one other major nation which is cheaper, which is the UK at 19.5%. Now, what you've seen there is that it's actually shifted quite a few companies' strategies, both in repatriating uh, revenues from outside of the US to spend in the US as well. So that's what, you know, part of the reason you saw Celgene by Juno for $9 billion, Amgen making investments in manufacturing, J&J um, doing the R&D investment that it did. So a lot of things happening politically as well, alongside the opportunities presented through UK industrial strategy. So i just quickly introduce the panel today who's going to help discuss their perspectives on, on that particular environment. So we've got Jonas Mortensen, who's Vice President of Business Development from Almac. Uh, next to Jonas is Drew Birch, who's President of Drug Development and Commercial Operations Europe for Thermo Fisher Scientific. Then we've got Kath Mackay, who's Director of Aging Society, Health and Nutrition from Innovate UK. And next to Kath, we've got Christoph Heinemann, Transformation Leader and Global Transformation Office from Sanofi. And then right at the end, we've got Mike Ward, who some of you might recognize, who's a journalist with Informa. And I think we can rely on some provocative statements from you, Mike. So I put Mike at the end to fill in the gaps and maybe decode what our panelists might be saying. So with no further ado, uh, Jonas, maybe I'll kick off with you and uh, you can tell me you know, a little bit of what you think about disruption in, in your part of the, the value chain. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, so thank you. So I guess, uh, so before actually when I started up here in Almac, uh, leading up the sales team as well, um, the first thing I actually did when I had them together as well to put them aside and I asked them to come up with a structure where sales is no longer needed in the supply chain. Now, as you may imagine, they turned a little bit pale. You know, what, what was I thinking about as well? But the real the matter is, what's really the value they also, you know, we as, a, as an organization actually is providing as well. That's really what I wanted to, 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 to have a discussion about. Because if you think about it, what we actually, you know, do today as well, uh, and what you actually can go out and buy uh, in the market as well, is, you know, first of all, it's very customized, potentially very solution-oriented as well. But if you think about it, just 20 years ago, what you could not buy on the internet versus what you can do today is obviously shifted significantly. So uh, what I also can imagine is what's going to happen in the future is that even those customized solutions, more, you know, um, adaptable solutions, actually something will be able to actually buy online instead. But that also means, obviously, that the organization and the sales individuals and how we actually structure ourselves need to be very different than what it is today. Otherwise, we would not be keep up, keep up. And I think one of the key things is obviously about information, obviously having the information ready and available, what they actually need to make the decisions on. 
uh, but also it comes in down to the trust. So essentially the visibility into the actually supply chain, uh, what is actually happening, so it's not, doesn't, it's not really a, a black box anymore, but it's actually unveiled what's actually happening within the, the extended arm of, uh, of pharma and actually biotech as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's some of the key things. Yeah, okay, great, thanks Jonas. And thanks for bringing up the, the um, discussion about trust, because I think trust alongside collaboration can help people really navigate this, this changing system of just now. Drew, on to you. Sure, thank you, uh, and you know, thank you all for joining today. The, uh, the um, you know, we see from Thermo Fisher's perspective things in from a few different angles, I guess, the, um, the, the API or biologic drug, su drug substance, but also the, the drug product and uh, clinical trial services. And regulatory is certainly a, a key dynamic that's, uh, you know, potentially moving things around right now. I think you know what uh, what we aim to do really is three things, right? Increase the the probability of success, shorten the timelines, and lower the cost. And uh, the regulators, you know, it's not all in one direction, right? But the reg regulatory authorities right now are are not exactly helping that with uh, with Brexit. That presents some additional barriers potentially. In general, though, there's been some positive trends, right? I mean, obviously, we could address Europe as, as one market for, uh, for a long time heretofore. And we even had promise of the US uh, making that uh, process easier and therefore cheaper for all of you and ultimately for patients um, with regulatory recognition. Now, I can't say we've seen that, right? I've had the FDA in three of my facilities in the past month in Europe. Um, but that's a promise and a potential that's out there. Obviously, the UK removing itself from the EU pulls that back in some regard and introduces a little more uh, complexity that, that introduces cost. And, you know, that's not lost on anybody, right? We're, we're up to uh, almost having two, two regulatory inspections uh, per week, right? Uh, across our network, so that's quite a bit if you go through the year. Um, and it's not all EU, it's not all FDA, it's, you know, and visa, it's, uh, it's South Korea, you know, the list goes on. But, uh, but that burden may rise a bit, uh, and the burden of uh, QP release um, may increase, hopefully it won't here in the UK. But, uh, but those all add cost into the system. Now, all that said, I think on the, the quality front, all of that regulatory attention obviously helps us, helps as an industry get to a place where, uh, particularly as more and more of the products are sterile, right, that we're operating at that quality level that gives people the confidence, particularly when we're now talking about medicines that in many cases save lives as opposed to just maybe have a percentage chance of saving a life or, um, or uh, extending it for a number of months. Instead, you know, there are opportunities out there to extend life by, by years. Uh, so, uh, so that quality element is valuable. We don't want to undermine or undercut that. Uh, but how can we navigate through the cost part? I think that's a key piece. Um, at the same time, I think for the UK, you know, we see some opportunities because in addition to the regulatory currents, there are technology currents, and you know we see this with cell therapy, right? We see autologous treatments, we see companion diagnostics, we see a lot of trends that uh, result in not only different types of treatments, but also different pathways that could exist from a regulatory standpoint. So having uh, reclaimed independence, in a sense, from a regulatory standpoint, you know, the UK has, for uh, decades, been, uh, been a leader in the pharmaceutical industry uh, and in the innovation in that industry, will continue to be a leader in, in innovation in that industry. And I think there's opportunity as regulatory regimes evolve to be at the forefront of some of that evolution. So that's, a, I think, an exciting element that, uh, that could op offer opportunity for the whole industry to uh, continue to evolve in response to some of this technology wave that's coming through. Yeah. Okay, and I'm glad you ended on a positive note there, Drew, in terms of what we can make of this situation, particularly around leadership in the regulatory and the scientific area. 
Kath, you're, you've been closely involved in industrial strategy, etc. The work we've been doing, I'd be really keen to hear your views. Great, thank you, Joe. So um, I'm Kath McKay. I work for Innovate UK, which is the UK's innovation agency and the prime channel by which government incentivises innovation in, in business. Um, as of April this year, we became part of UK Innovate Research and Innovation with the Research Councils. This is a £7 billion um, non-departmental government body solely focused on UK research and innovation. Um, so at Innovate UK, we like disruption. I think there's an argument that there is too much disruption at the moment. I think we want to be working in the sweet spot of disruption. Um, Technology-wise, we like disruptive technologies and we fund anything that we think is of high value to UK PRC, but we're deliberately seeking to fund disruptive technologies that others will not fund. So things such as um, cell and gene therapy, innovative medicines manufacturing techniques, um, precision medicine are, are examples, and essentially we're working to provide government funding to de-risk companies for further private investment. So we are a grant funding body. Um, we make sure that businesses have the right collaborators. We have research infrastructure uh, via the Catapult Network, um, so the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult here in London, and also Medicines Discovery Catapult up in Cheshire. And we're scaling our, our funding and our initiatives um, to, to grow businesses. So we're moving out of the grant funding environment to offer innovation loans for businesses that are more uh, mature and sophisticated. And also we're working closely with uh, private investors, so funding with uh, VCs into businesses. And uh, we also have a place in delivering the government elements of the government's industrial strategy and the life science industrial, stra industrial strategy, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, which Eric spoke about earlier. And we're doing this through something called the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, which is probably the largest um, investment of UK government into innovation, um, certainly during my lifetime. So the initial announcement was um, a £4.7 billion uplift and another £1.1 billion was announced in the budget in the end of October. And really this is a large managed programme seeking to um, I suppose advance businesses with, um, with scientists to address the major societal challenges of our time. So in, I suppose in, in my remit and what we will be of interest to, to you here today, we have a £190 million challenge in innovation in medicines and manufacturing. We have a £210 million challenge looking to uh, use health data for precision medicine um, and diagnostics. And we also have a £98 million challenge looking at assistive technologies and allowing people to live in their own homes um, for longer. So that's the scale at which UK government um, is trying to address these problems. Obviously, it's, it's not a panacea, but I've certainly noticed with my time with Innovate UK, there is a more coordinated UK government effort um, thinking how, about how it can partner businesses with multinationals um, to gain value for the UK and address some very specific societal challenges. Mm. Okay, that's great, Kath. And I think it was about this time last year when IQVIA produced a report which was saying how many people in the industry were aware of industrial strategy. And it was it was quite small um, in terms of the number of people who were aware of it. And we just want to have a quick show of hands. Are people aware of those funds that Kath just mentioned there? Well, I think that's much better than last year. So well done. <laughs> that's very good. And that's really reassuring as well. Thanks. So Christoph, over to you. I mean, I've got a lot of discussion here around the UK and be interested in your perspectives from a global position where you perceive the UK to be and what you see other countries doing just now. Sure. Uh, first, thank you for the invitation, for having me here. And uh, I'm happy to share some of my personal experience working on transformation programs across the pharma industry over 20 plus years. First, I must say I was very happy to hear from you that you actually like and uh, disruption and that you would like to uh, catalyze it further because I think we could if we were uh, looking back in five or seven years on this day today probably say that we were today in the less complex times mm -hmm. than versus where we will be and what I'd like to express here is is the thought that I've assembled over the last years I'm not sure it's a super breakthrough thought but I still find it meaningful to get back to this thought from time to time that transformation and disruption are no longer one-time events which happen and then you deal with them and then you are after the tide or before the tide 
but you have multiple of those types going through the, uh, through the industry and through all the organizations in this industry at the same time. And it is difficult to determine the height mm -hmm. of the tide. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to show this in few examples, in three examples, which to me are most meaningful with regards to industry transformation. So the first one is geographical, the second one is scientific, and the third one is structural. On geographic, well, I'd like to point out on a very conscientious basis China and not Europe as the place where we are seeing very significant transformation. And to me, I've been working uh, on several types of China projects over the last years. What we've seen in the last two years, even in the months of this year, in terms of speed of transformation in that country, to most of us Europeans is something completely unheard of. We all still can think of the times that that market took the products which were marketed elsewhere in the world and had all the other countries trying out those uh, uh, programs, uh, products, and then applying for Chinese clinical trials before then, 10 years after launch in Europe, uh, almost at the time of PATEX in Europe, you could start marketing in China. Now, we've seen in the last years a tremendous acceleration of the regulatory system. They've approved five times, 10 times uh, clinical trials, as well as new drugs, and they've updated their national reimbursement list in a much more dynamic uh, uh, um, sense since. I don't know if people know that in terms of individualized cell therapies, CAR-T, there are more patients today in Chinese clinical trials than in US clinical trials, not speaking of Europe here. And if you would look at the inflow of venture capital into that continent, which is building its own innovation industry, it has reached the levels of the other hotspots of, uh, of the world. And at the same time, this government is starting to look at the quality of their generics industry, which was always there after the seal and is raising the standards. So uh, everybody has to deal with this topic today. I think all of the major global healthcare organizations, uh, but we really have to watch out for a very different scale and speed uh, with China. Uh, the scientific transformation which is ongoing was mentioned by many of the speakers already today. And these are all these new modalities, right? The times that we had small molecules and that we had what we were calling biologics, which were simple antibodies, uh, they're behind us. If we analyze all these uh, pipelines of pharma companies today, but also the biotech space, which is feeding those pipelines in the longer term, you're talking about five, seven, ten types of different modalities. And making these different modalities from complex antibodies, multi, um, uh, uh, from antibodies coupled to toxins, over to gene therapies and different flavors of cell therapies is nothing trivial at all. Mm -hmm. It poses big questions to the organizations that are manufacturing and then commercializing these products on a larger scale. And um, the amount of money that is inflowing uh, into the biotech sector continues to nourish this plethora of different, <coughs> different things. I find it interesting that in this context, manufacturing becomes again a kind of core competence in the mm -hmm. industry innovation space. It was not um, during certain times of small molecule development. It could be kind of bought wherever you want it to go, but certainly here with these new um, technologies, that's no longer the case. And the third dimension is structural and was also mentioned by some of the other speakers. Um, it's the space of digital companies. It's the space of data providers um, connecting with other healthcare providers, with pharma companies. I guess this is a tide which is going over some time and we're sometimes not so sure whether we've already reached the peak or how, how quick it will be. I remember having been at that conference four or five years ago, and there was a lot of talk about disruption in that space. Has it happened in that same speed that was anticipated some years ago? I'm not so sure. Are all these business models profitable today based on digital or drug plus products? I'm not so sure, but the inflow of interest and money is still there, so I think the learnings are being taken. So from all three dimensions, transformation is here to stay. And what does it mean for organizations? Because all organizations have to, have to deal with them at the same time. To me, it means that transformation becomes kind of a core discipline of organizations. They have to ask themselves, how do we do it with this uncertainty from a structural uh, perspective? And it's nothing that can be just given on a project basis to consultants and outside counselors. And that requires a different way of working. It requires people to move between different functions of enterprises to be meaningful part of such debates. So these are a couple of mm -hmm. thoughts uh, to, to get yeah. us started. No, that's great. No, thank, thanks, Christoph, for mentioning that. And I think particularly in China, 
Certainly many of our clients underestimate the pace at which China is evolving. They think, you know, IP is a concern and also slow regulatory processes. So again, thanks for, for highlighting some of the trends there. And actually manufacturing becoming back a core competency, I think that'll be music to the ears of many people in the audience here, many of whom come from, from manufacturing. So Mike, so you're Chief Content Officer at Informa Pharma, and you've been listening to the panelists, etc. So really keen to hear your views. Yeah, so where do I start? Um, <laughs> You mentioned pest at the beginning, yeah. and so I kind of I am the token pest on on, on, <laughs> on the panel. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, an informer farmer. Um, the IQVIA uh, survey you mentioned, yeah. we did that for them, yeah. um, and uh, I've been covering the the pharmaceutical biotech industry for 35 years, and it's kind of interesting hearing about sort of disruption because um, I think the big challenge for the pharmaceutical industry is, is it prepared for disruption? Because every time they had the opportunity to embrace it, they kind of resisted it. So for example, uh, in 1984, when I started covering, um, I was covering biotechnology, which is this kind of like new, new great thing. Uh, the people who were embracing it were the people at the chemical companies and the agrochemical companies, the pharmaceutical companies, they saw it as a sort of a technology thing. So I, okay, so it means that we can make human growth hormone or we can make human insulin yeah. in, in bugs rather than sort of having to like slaughter pigs and, and get it from dead bodies. Um, and that's what they did. Um, so therefore there was, there was a sort of a scale up opportunity, but actually in, in the 1980s, you know, most pharmaceutical executives saw uh, biotechnology as an academic curiosity, mm. and it won't work. Yeah. Okay. Then we had the sort of the, the all the potential around monoclonal antibodies, and for absolutely years, you know, people hated it. Now there were sort of you know issues, etc. But little biotech companies like you know Cambridge and Innovative Technology continued to sort of you know <coughs> look at those challenges. And then, and then, and then, found answers. Um, now we sort of, you know, look at. You, you mentioned sort of, you know, now we've got the sort of the, sort of the digital wave. So sort of, we're seeing the likes of Google and IBM and Apple all start, you know, sort of sniffing around the industry. Some of it is in terms of their their seeding sort of venture capital, etc. But again, sort of, you know, talking to people. They sort of think, oh yeah, but they, they, they won't be able to do it because we are a highly regulated industry. And all you have to do is look at where um, you know, other people have tried to hide around uh, regulation when you've had a disruptive technology. So think of Uber and the black cabs, yeah. or think of um, Airbnb and the, uh, um, uh, and the hotel sector. And what has actually happened in all those places is because consumers want this, okay, the regulations will change. So the pharmaceutical industry is going to have to sort of embrace this. It's going to realize that, you know, it's not in Kansas anymore. It's a bit like all the sort of this discussion we have with Brexit. You know, yeah. something's going to happen um, and we're going to have to sort of deal with it. So I sort of think that it, it, it's interesting that, you know, I'm not really sort of, you know, convinced that the pharmaceutical industry is yet there. The new sort of buzzword is artificial intelligence, yeah. and it's kind of interesting to sort of see you know, how different pharmaceutical companies are responding to it, and where in the sort of the, the food chain of the sort of the hierarchy of the companies, there are decision makers who have actually got kind of that responsibility. Mm. So I think around that, um, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, I, I, I remain to be convinced you know, and I think that the pharmaceutical industry has always been very conservative. And, you know, I mean, if, if they screw up, right, people die. So, you know, you can sort of see why, you know, the, 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 there's obviously going to be uh, a caution around that. Um, mm. I, I love it when the sort of, you know, we, we did that survey about the sort of, you know, uh, people's understanding of the uh, UK life sciences um, uh, strategy, uh, the industrial strategy. And it was great the fact that. Um, at least one was put in place, and it was the first one that was put in place. Um, and you know, it's just a recognition of, you know, how important the life science sector is here to the UK. But 
yeah, I, yeah, I roll my eyes when I hear numbers, mm. right, in terms of investment, because we know that politicians basically, they just relabel the same money. It's, you know, how much of that is, is, is new money? And then even though we're hearing millions, you just have to sort of think that Jose Mourinho spent 365 million pounds on Manchester United uh, players in the last two or three years. And, you know, we can sort of see that, you know, sometimes 365 million doesn't get you very much. <laughs> I apologise for any Manchester United. Is someone tweeting that, please? <laughs> yeah, it's just like Jose Mourinho is going to come after me. Yeah, he's, 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 he's got a he's got a hard a, a hard stare. And then and then sort of like you're looking looking at China, and I think we'll probably come back to China because of course yeah. there's the all the issues around um, uh, what's going on uh, with with Trump, etc. Um, you know. China is, it, it, it is absolutely massive. I mean, not only are they investing in their own, mm -hmm. okay, 40% of all venture capital money that's gone into biotech is, has got you know, Chinese fingerprints all over it. And you know, the, 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 the Chinese are um, you know, clearly on, 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 a, on a massive drive. Uh, and and you know, that's why you know, all of a sudden you've got sort of you know, populist, etc., sort of trying to put up the barriers, but you know, the sort of the genie's out. Um, and whether or not that means that the money that doesn't go into the US is going to go into Europe, mm. I doubt it. I think they're going to plough it back into into China. The reason why they're ploughing it into the US US was just to get uh, a, a, their fingerprints on best practice. Yeah. Anyway, that that's just. Thoughts. Yeah, I did say you're going to be provocative. I think that's pretty good there. So I guess cool question. In fact, I mean, from Mike's thing about are we ready to embrace this rather than resist change, expect accept transformation and embrace it? I don't know if there's any immediate views from the panel here in that. No, well, I think well, so I think we need to first yeah. of all, right? I mean, uh -huh. so uh, for, for example, um, in respect to actually adapting systems and process and things like that, which is obviously some of the challenge as well. You know, for example, uh, you know, at Elmark as well, we there was also a you know customer coming, a client coming, they had a need for peptide synthesis, essentially patient unique, so one batch, one patient, um, and essentially they had we only had like three weeks to do it, release it, and get it out the door. And let's just say, to be honest, our system were not necessarily set up, so I guess you know flexibility and quality doesn't necessarily always rhyme together, um, and I guess also that's what we realized that essentially we needed to adapt the systems. To make sure the protocol, the SOPs, and everything, mm -hmm. and uh, essentially just materials of flow, etc., yeah. just simply just needed to be changed in order to accommodate that um, and to get it out the door and actually so the patient actually get it um, in, in time as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess that also shows that even though that system sometimes and quality system can be rigid, that actually there are possibilities to actually adapt those to make sure they actually can accommodate. And I'm sure also from a regulatory bodies as well that you mentioned as well, obviously need to adapt in the same way in order to. Uh, allow things like that to happen. Yeah, okay, that's, uh, and maybe over to you, Drew, as well. I mean, I, I, again, as suppliers to the industry, how much of that disruption and change is being demanded by your, your customers? And how it, much can you, as a supplier, lead that change and embrace it, as, as Mike challenged? Yeah, no, it, it, uh, so I agree, it is. We see it every day, right? Mm. That pressure is there on us as well. And I completely agree with Mike. I think the industry, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, was slow to pick up the opportunity from biotechnology. There were exceptions, but in general, that, that was slow. I think the, uh, the companies, they're large, right? So it's hard, but you know, whether they're under more pressure today or the economic pressure is more directly applied, I don't know. But we do see companies um, jumping into, whether it's the, the large pharma companies or the, um, the biotech companies who have been very successful jumping very aggressively into new technologies, whether it be cell and gene therapies, um, whether it be um, you know, uh, MHRA drugs. So there's, there's activity, whether it's through partnering or acquisition, that is bringing those technologies into the uh, either partnership with or into the hands of the organizations that have the commercial capabilities to get them to patients. I think the regulators, you know, that piece, not surprisingly, uh, given the way regulation works, but it tends, tends to adapt a little <laughs> more slowly. Um, again, we have seen, uh, I think, some encouraging signs with different types of trials being approved, with um, 
you know, uh, fast track designations and the like, so things being able to get to patients faster that uh, evidence, even among the regulators, some, some, you know, is it enough? No, of course mm -hmm. not. Uh, from a human perspective, from an industry perspective, it's never enough, right? But, um, but we have seen some encouraging signs. Yeah. Um, I suppose we've had, you know, some, some snippets there of industrial strategy earlier. It'd be interesting with the views of the panel about what you know of UK industrial strategy. Is it enough? I mean, Mike, you made the comment there about the money that's behind it, but, you know, maybe some of the other players here. I'll tell you what, no, I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not beating you up because I, I think, <laughs> I, you know, as I sort of mentioned, I do think... Um, you know, the fact that there was political recognition of the importance, uh, I think, is, I think is significant. Um, and I just sort of think that the, the sort of the, the challenge is for, um, for the sort of the, the ecosystem, whether they're, they're, you know, sort of they're the sort of academic scientists or whether they're sort of, you know, in small companies yeah. or whether they're big pharma, to actually you know, embrace it and, you know, create something that's collegiate rather than, you know, I mean, what, one of the advantages, okay, and there are not many advantages of potentially coming out of the EU is, um, you know, when it comes to sort of the research funding that you can get from the European Union, because, mm. you know, I think Natalie's probably still here, um, so I'm going to get beaten up again. Um, but the... The, you know, one of the big, big challenges that when, when sort of you're creating these, these consortia yeah. is that, you know, there are some people who are in there just because they, it's tokenistic. Yeah. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they, they, they tick a political box. And there is also the, the, the you know, the sort of, you know, how the money is sort of, you know, allocated and the amount of work that goes in just to sort of, you know, process that money. You know, I've spoken mm -hmm. to a lot of, you know, biotech companies, it's, 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 it's not worth it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I think that the important thing about, you know, sort of the industrial strategy is it's actually got, you've got to go from policy to actual, yeah. you know, something that is, this action. And I haven't actually seen, you know, a lot, but, you know, I've got a hell of a lot of respect for, for Sir John Bell and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the people who've been involved, you know, behind it. So, you know, I know that the, the sort of the intellectual capital that's been invested in it is, you know, totally solid. Yeah, we just need to see, um, you know, the sort of the political capital with a capital P, and then actually we need some, you know, real capital. Yes. Yeah. No, I agree. That's if I could ask that, yeah, that's to pick up on some of your your earlier earlier comments, but I live in Manchester and I'm not going to go near the Manchester United things. So <laughs> <laughs> probably cause more offence. Um, but it's. Yeah, the numbers are relatively small, but it's, it's more than the money. It's about those consortia and actually starting to bring the right people together to, to make a change. And I think it's very early. I mean, the, the sector deal is a year old. Um, there's going to be further iterations. But actually, for the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, some of those um, initial investments are only kind of just going out the door. So actually, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's uh -huh. too early to really comment on the impact. And you know, that's something we'll be doing in, in, in years to come. But I think it's the importance, you know, you know, 100 million here, 100 million there. But actually, that is a conduit to kind of the right collaborations happening and good things happening. It's all about bringing um, businesses together, um, working um, with with academics, um, and actually get, getting facilities built, um, getting new products tested. So I think the money is is one thing, and that's the bit that I suppose we talk about. It's the it's the headlines, but actually. It's the money allowing things to happen, which actually is, is more important. And I think we've, we've just not seen it at this scale yeah. in the no, UK for right. quite some time. And I think very much the flywheel effect. You mentioned the catapults, but the aim yeah. was the seed money to get innovations I through and then attract really, yeah. private sector investment, yeah. which where it becomes virtuous in terms of a, a cycle. Yeah. yeah, I think if I can come in, I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a relatively recent resident of the UK, but. Um, the, uh, I think the opportunity, right, is um, for it to be less bureaucratic, right? It's uh, kind of locally owned and operated, and it builds across, uh, you know, a strong base of companies, a strong ecosystem of innovator companies, biotech companies and the like, a strong academic foundation here in the UK. And uh, so I think the opportunity is by moving quicker into 
emerging areas of new innovation and concentrating those resources together. Um, you know, whether it's more dollars or not, uh, you know, I, I don't know how that ends up, but, um, but the opportunity is to catalyze more rapid entry and evolution of, of new areas, and I think the UK has done that in the past and can do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Let's all open it up to the audience now. Um, we've been listening a long time. Martin's got his hand up immediately. <laughs> so if you can get him a mic, and if you can announce who you are and who you represent, please. Yeah, I'm uh, Martino Picardo. I'm chairman of Discovery Park. I'm also a Mancunian. <laughs> I'm also a season ticket holder. <laughs> I will see you later, Mike. A <laughs> um, couple of observations. One, I do think the Innovate UK money has been going long enough to know that particularly for SMEs and startups, it's making a difference. But I would put it back to the, co to the panel that we, we don't invest for long enough in transformative technologies. Mm -hmm. The graphene story, what may or should have happened at the Genome Campus. We've got lots of examples where we've started mm. significant investment and then not carried it through. Yeah. And so the argument might be that the catapults might be gone in three, four years' time and we'll find another flavour. So how, as an industry, do we make sure that we invest and pick winners? Because that's the bit that government struggles with. Yeah. With picking the winners and running with those winners and making it happen. Yeah. Okay. So how do we have the long-term funding and how do we pick winners? Maybe if we can have the mic down to here. Who'd like to pick that one up? I think I'll pick up some of that. I think uh, in terms of long-term funding, I mean, I think that Innovate UK funding has it's got its place, and I think in terms it's for the grants are up to three million pounds, for example. So I think it, it's going to have its place. Um, for example, you know, we we're funding kind of first in man studies, but for that amount of money, that there's very little you can do. And I think we all recognise in the, K the UK there is an issue around patient capital and longer term funding. Yeah. Um, and I think as a, as a government body, I suppose we, the, there is only so much we can do. I think we're fighting for our kind of piece of the pie with a number of different government bodies and di di government departments doing different things. So I think we will be relatively limited. Um, and I think it's gonna be smaller projects that, that we can fund, but we are kind of working with private investors to, to raise the profile of that need. Um, I've forgotten the other question already. I think in terms picking of winners. picking winners, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, well, that's interesting. I mean, I think government policy of recent times is very much kind of not picking winners and actually mm. kind of giving everyone the right platform to succeed. And I think that has been a, a trend in, in policy o over mm. recent years. But there, yeah, there is an argument about, and especially as we go into to, uh, exiting the EU, should we be thinking about what we're good at and, and recognising that and, and doubling down on that? I think, I think that is something that we, that, that there is an argument for doing that and something that should be considered. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a challenge. I think when you speak to businesses, one of the challenges I have is that I suppose businesses and regions all think they're good at everything. And I think there is <coughs> so an honest and critical kind of conversation to be had about what are the UK strengths and should we be doubling down on that? Yeah, and I think maybe that's gone with advanced therapies because, again, people look at the example of monoclonal antibodies as almost quite a big fish that got away from the UK, potentially, maybe from the biologics concern. Christoph? So, so maybe I'd uh, like to suggest a comparison to China for, for this point. Yeah. I cannot really judge on the UK situation, but what are the elements that they are doing? First, it's a very different time horizon they are looking at. Yeah. They're looking at 10, 15 year time horizon when they put up policies. And President Xi himself writes about Healthy China 2030 yeah. as a kind of mega theme which addresses the concern of the end population before they decline it down on industrial strategy. Yeah. Then they come back with the China 2025 manufacturing vision of what will be manufactured in China. And guess what? It's not the products of the past that the, company, uh, that the country grew with. They want to have health care there. Mm. But then they are very decent and honest of what they have today, yeah. which essentially means many of the companies don't comply GMP and they don't control the process. And the level of scrutiny that they today have versus their own com companies, and we saw it in the summer in the latest uh, questions around the Vazatan API as well as the, the vaccines quality, they're much more consequent today, and they're inviting others to bring in these technologies. Yeah. Um, it's the case on the biologics, for example, where they know they can start themselves, they bring others, and they give others five, seven, eight years to make some profits from some time before they will build their, mm. their own thing. So to me, they are deploying several strategies in parallel 
to be credible uh, with an overall industrial vision, and that's what what means we have to mm, watch them. Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, I mean, so that, I mean, the, they've got the the advantage of scale. Um, I think that you're with China. I mean, what what is interesting when you come around? You mentioned about sort of the regulations. The the Chinese FDA, which a few years ago was you know, approving stuff that was two or three years behind the behind the curve, yeah. is now you've got to it. You're not, you're only going to get fast track if it's you know contemporaneous with the um, you know what's going on at the FDA or EMA. They've increased the number of people who actually, um, you know, the regulators within the, the Chinese FDA, sort of, you know, a fantastic number. I mean, it was, you know, something like, you know, 50 a few years ago. Now it's 1,500 and it's mm -hmm. growing more. Now, obviously, they've got issues, the fact that the, the architect of all that change has kind of lost his job mm -hmm. over the sort of the vaccine scandal. But, um, I mean, he wasn't involved with the vaccine scandal, but he, he was mm -hmm. the boss, so, you know, he, he took the hit. So I think the sort of the Chinese are, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, they have this 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 opportunity. There's um, a lot of expat Chinese who are going back to to uh, to the um, uh, to China from from the U.S. because they can see the opportunity and they can sort of see that they can all drive around in Jaguars and Ferraris, etc. If they're if they're successful entrepreneurs, and there is that opportunity there. But to come back to you know. The, the question of well, what should the UK do? I'd sort of like just sort of, you know, leapfrog from from what 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 uh, Kat was saying about the, uh, you know, double down on what you're good at. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because you know what the UK is really good at is science. Yeah. Okay. You know we have a disproportionate number of you know uh, Nobel Prize winners. You know um, we you know over the, over. Decades, we sort of demonstrated that we are at the sort of, uh, you know, much of the forefront of the thinking in the sort of the life sciences. So the UK government, the best thing it could do, and probably sort of you know, a fantastic return on investment, would be to plough as much money as it can into sort of life sciences research at the universities, mm -hmm. and actually, you know, ensure that these these individuals do get the time to actually be able to think disruptively. Um, and not worry about you know, where am I going to get Max Grant from, et cetera, et cetera. Especially as you sort of think the horizon 2020 is no longer a horizon. Um, so I think that you know that would be you know one way. And you know, I mean, sort of you know, just looking at the oh well, it's invented somewhere else. Frankly, when it really comes down to it, uh, we are all going to benefit from these technologies, mm. you know, one way or another. And we hear the pharmaceutical company saying it's all about the patients. Yeah. You know, if it's all about the patients, it doesn't matter whether they're American, European, Chinese, or or, or, or Brits. Yeah. Okay. No, that's great. Thank you. We've got to over here, and then we go over to Tony. So go ahead with your question, please. Hi, my name's Nigel. I work for Farm Trust, um, and we are one of those tech companies that are bridging AI, IoT, blockchain. You name it, we're there. Um, actually, we're already working with Rob Lurney at the Digital Catapult, so Innovate UK we're already too familiar with. We're um, linked in with the IMI and the current way of funding, so we're kind of high on their sort of agenda as well. Um, but my question really is that, um, and I bear in mind, I was also at Pfizer for 17 years, so um, in a global function, so I've done that side of it. I was working on big data infrastructure, setting up Spark Beyond and Hadoop and all the fancy sort of data stuff that you need to, to make a big enterprise like Pfizer work globally. But now I took the, the leap 10 months ago to kind of try the tech startup side. And uh, we're sitting here kind of on the bleeding edge of technology. And I kid you not, it is the bleeding edge of technology because we feel the pain most acutely when there's 10 of you trying to figure out yeah. how you're going to make this business work. Um, what do we have to do to kind of de-risk? Because talking to Rob, learning at the Digital Catapult, uh, we know that these are the opportunities for us, the field labs, to kind of get out there. But getting the attention is really t tough and challenging. So what, what can you as the panel and possibly even some of the others in the room help us to do to kind of be noticed. Here we go. A plea for help. What advice would you give? I guess I'm, <laughs> sitting, I'm, <laughs> sitting, I'm sitting back because I think you're already engaging with Innovate UK and my colleagues. Really. I mean, I think it's a case of... Yeah. 
you maybe do. I mean, I, th I think it's talk to people and, and partner. I think I think that's. I think you, if you're going speaking with a casper, it sounds like you're speaking potentially with the right people. But I think it's just have conversations, find out from potential new customers what they're looking for. I mean, it's all very generic advice, but that that's the advice I, I would give you in terms of I guess your, your product and your offering, is just speak with p your potential customers and and get some insights as as, as to what they want. And I think it's it's talk. It's, it's good to talk. Talk with people who potentially are, are new partners and who could help you find markets and and sources of new investment as you go into your next phase. So I suppose it's all very generic advice, but I think that that's what I would give you is is uh, is speak to people and and speak to Agreed, people while you're here. Sure, whoever found what would you yeah. say? Not just us. I'm not talking about mm. me I mean, I, I'm kind of with Kath, actually, because it's such a hot topic for Big Pharma in particular, that they're hungry for those sorts of innovations and partnerships. So I think if you engage in those, they'll diligence you. They'll come up with risk areas, etc. I guess the other thing is to de-risk yourself from a financial perspective as well, in terms of getting that first loss capital in and the softer capital that can actually help you with, with that. Yeah. Can I go, can I ask a, can you hold on, Tony? And I'll, I'll ask a... I'll lose it. <laughs> you won't keep hold of it. <laughs> Can we have a question from a, a lady in the audience, please? Hello there. My name is Renata Crome, and I'm ex Roche and ex um, charity sector. And um, this is where I'm coming from. Uh, my question to you is that um, none of the members of the panel have mentioned that very, very important member of the ecosystem, and that's the um, the medical research um, um, com um, organizations, yeah, where there's some fabulous. Um, disruptive innovation going on, world-class um, research going on. And um, I just wanted to um, ask the panel, and starting with Kath in particular, um, how much you recognise the innovation and support the innovation in the charity sector? <coughs> that's, a, that's a really interesting question, mm. actually. Uh, we've, we've started working with the charity sector for the, for the very first time. Um, and there's a couple of reasons I suppose, why we started doing that. Um, I would say we've had... We've had engagement with the charity sector for since since we've existed, since we were, we were back in the TSB. But I'd say it's been relatively warm and fuzzy, and we, we've not done a great deal together. Um, and then I suppose we've always been looking for ways to work with each other. I think the benefits of, of working together is that you know I suppose you have access to patients and the patient voice that that we don't have, and also a lot of our businesses, especially on the smaller side, don't have. Um, and I think from our point of view as well, there are, there are businesses and new kind of channels and markets that, that charities have that, that, that we didn't have either. And I think that there is, I suppose, a, an element of we, we always work with the usual suspects. We, we have the same types of businesses applying in, into us. Um, so we kicked off a couple of charity collaborations last year. Um, there's three I can think of. There's one with Asthma Research UK where, um, and, and one with uh, Cystic Fibrosis UK where um, we essentially work with them uh, on competitive grant funding for, for products that they were developing. So with Asthma Research UK, for example, they were doing something um, on novel detection, especially uh, specifically in, in paediatric uh, asthma, which um, is obviously a, there's a huge need and not a great deal of success. So we were able to give essentially fund them to run a competition um, to attract in innovators on, on research projects that could be commercialised. So I think it, it was quite risky for us. It was something we haven't done, and it was we had to make a, a real case for there being a business need for that. Um, but actually there was. It was a whole different sector that we weren't working with. So um, we, we've started off small, and I, th I think it's an area where we will, uh, we will increase our activity um, as, we, as we develop. But I think that there's a very... A special place that I think charities have got that that we don't have, and a lot of the businesses that we're working with don't have access to charities or, or patients. So I think it's growing, growing importance. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And again, there's sessions tomorrow on on that. Just yeah. I mean, just I, yeah. so 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 when I talked about the universities, I did sort of, I kind of meant medical medical research or uh, um, uh, charities as well. I mean, the Wellcome Trust is the you know 
the world's largest or the world's second largest um, uh, funder of, of medical research. Um, so it, it's it's very significant. And you know, in the days now that you know we've got you know sort of orphan medicines, rare diseases, the the role of uh, medical research charities, particularly th those focused to those um, uh, you know, particular diseases, is going to become more and more important. I mean, it, it's one way that the pharmaceutical industry can actually engage with, with, with the patient community to actually make sure that they're developing you know, medicines that actually patients want rather than something that they can clinically or you know, scientifically do. Um, and I think that you get that around, say, for example, Parkinson's, etc. Whereas, you know, a, a, there's a lot of focus on, you know, um, through discussions with the charities around the, the dys dyskinesia that's associated with, because that's, that, that's a big issue. So I do think that they, they have an important role. And I think that, you know, as the pharmaceutical industry tries to be more patient centric and actually demonstrate that, I think we're going to sort of see, you know, uh, more engagement. Tony, you've been waiting patiently. Over what, to you. Waiting patiently. Um, <laughs> my dear friend Mike, I want to do a, a mind melt with Mike. So, so this number is one, Tony Sedgwick. I'm Tony Sedgwick. Yes, number so. one, say what you think, Mike. Um, <laughs> I, I spend a lot of time in bars normally with Mike, and he, he tells me what he thinks. I mean, what I don't quite, I'm frustrated because I think what I sense is I'm a West Ham supporter. If you're a West Ham supporter, you've always been in turbulent times. <laughs> but the question really is, is one, I don't, managing disruption. Can you manage disruption? I suppose that really is an interesting thing. And I suppose what I'm very interested in is people, people, and people. And so are we really, I've, I haven't heard, I've heard what I call a lot of rock logic, which says, you know, we listen to the issues, we use all these spreadsheets, and we fathom it out. But surely when turbulent times come, that's where you need the people to have those sort of minds that can really adapt to change. And there used to be, some years ago, this thing called investing in people. Mm -hmm. um, are we still investing in people or not? And I asked Mike to give me the answer first because I like him. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, Mike. Or well, you don't like me. It's probably more, more to the point. Um, are we investing in people, um, I, I mean, again, it, I guess it comes back down to education. You know, I'm sounding like sort of some political party from the, the 1990s, you know, <laughs> education, education, education. Um, I think that the, I think one of the challenges that, that we have, um, you know, sort of, you know, my kids have now all, you know, they're not now either just graduated or they're at university. You know, the sort of critical thinking is not something that uh, is embraced enough. And and again, if if sort of governments could do something that would actually again sort of double down on what we were actually what we were good at, it was the fact that you know when I went to university, you could you know basically think. You were you 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 were given permission to think. Um, and I think that. <coughs> That's what we, we need to do. So investing in people, I'd invest in young people, and I'd invest in uh, opportunities to sort of develop critical thinking faculties. And I don't think we do enough of it. Yeah. Anybody else? I don't think we do enough of it either, to be honest with you. If, you. if you speak to any business, especially small businesses, about what they need, obviously, I mean, the first question is always money, uh, obviously, and, and especially when you're talking to Innovate UK, it's always about the grant money. But um, following that, it's, they, they need people, and they need people with very specific skill sets. And it might be someone like a QP, or it might be a, a life science business development professional. And there is a, there's a, there is a real gap. Where, where do you get those people? Um, and I think that, I, I can't speak on behalf of the whole of UK government, but I think in UKRI, there are going to be an increasing number of initiatives around skills and people, whether that be kind of at the PhD level um, or, or the apprentice level. Um, but I think that there will be a lot more coming through um, and we will be developing <coughs> strategies in that area in recognition of the fact that there is a huge gap. So uh, yeah, more is needed and I think it's a work in progress. Yeah. Okay, we're coming up to time. Can I just take two last quick questions in succession maybe? So if you want to go So um, my name's Janet Allen. I'm from the Cystic Fibrosis Trust and I'm pleased to hear 
Uh, you've mentioned the name when uh, you're talking about Innovate UK because we are working quite closely uh, with Innovate UK and with um, Catapult. Um, I, I think what I really wanted to say is that I'm, I'm delighted to hear that the pharmaceutical industry recognises the importance of patient voice um, and that a lot of the disruptive technologies potentially can come from the patient area. But we are working in a very risk-averse um, industry uh, from the point of view of NHS um, care. Mm. We've, we're, we're running trials at the moment in the use of remote monitoring at home, uh, which are funded by the Trust. Uh, and we are working with a moderately large company um, in this space. But the biggest resistance we're getting from is uh, disrupting the model of care that has stood good test of time for the last 20 years but is probably not fit for purpose today. So the problem is the risk in t making that change. Uh, the health professionals are the guys who are going to actually have to drive that change, um, but we're not in an environment that, that encourages them to do that. Yeah, and thanks for making that point. If you could pass the mic down here, just a very quick question from... Thanks. So I'm Melanie Senior, I'm a, I'm a journalist as well, like Mike. Um, I, I'll try and sort of segue on from that. I wanted to pick up on Christoph's point about the structural transformation and the fact is that pharmaceutical companies are now having to deliver outcomes, not just drugs, and the extent to which they then need to work closer with the system, the provider, the NHS, um, and the extent to which we have an advantage here in the UK, I want to bring in an industrial strategy angle, not only on that front, uh, I'd love the panel quick feedback on, on that, that disruption, <laughs> as in what pharma actually now has to deliver, not just the drug, but the outcome, and then another point about the cross-disciplinary education and the extent to which now, you know, they need data analytics, they need technology people, and our education system ultimately is going to have to perhaps think about uh, different combinations of subject matters as well as just the sort of vertically integrated that we've, we've been used to. That is happening in some universities across the UK. They have new kinds of integrated courses, but... I that was a yeah, comment as well as a question. Great. Thank okay, you. So maybe just a quick response to Melanie's comments and also the comments there about having to disrupt the model of care as well. And we really are up against time, so just some quick responses on that. Yeah, I'll go quickly. Uh, I certainly, I think there's that's where the opportunity lies, right, to bring the pieces together, and that's one of the opportunities you gain from being, you know, a, a relatively smaller piece of the, the whole world market, right? You can pull all the pieces together and make change mm -hmm. more quickly. It requires a willingness to embrace that change, right, among the provider community among the regulators, et cetera. But I think if, if you can do that, there's opportunity to think to, to, to bring different technologies from different fields together and move things in, in uh, new directions that can uh, bring uh, better outcomes. Yeah. So the appetite and the environment's there. Any other quick questions? So I'll, I, I was kind of encouraged by what Eric Nordkamp was saying um, on the, uh, the sort of fireside chat he had. Um, at the beginning, where there is a dialogue between government and and industry, yeah. uh, where at least they've got some idea of, or, of of creating a vision. Now, how they get, you know, to to, to, to their destination might be might, still might be uh, need need resolving. But I think that you know, if we can sort of you know recognise that both of them actually have a role in delivering, you know, better outcomes, better healthcare, etc., and they actually know what they're looking for. Uh, we can probably sort of you know, design a system that's more fit for purpose. Yeah. I mean, given all this disruption, I'd like to make a quick poll of you. Who is optimistic about the next 12 months in the UK? And who maybe might be more pessimistic? So can the optimists put up their hands, please? Oh, OK. <laughs> and the pessimists? Oh, my goodness. OK, we've got a majority of pessimists. We haven't actually yet uh, convinced people around that. So if I move to, to wrap up just now, um, if I, current themes coming through, and you can, you can work out, pair up over coffee to see who's a pessimist and if you can convert them. Uh, transruption and disruption, no longer the norm. It's something we do need to live with and actually understand and embrace. And particularly the view, we have all the, the functions there in terms of the appetite and the environment potentially to in, in embrace this. I think some interesting things, particularly from Kostov, about learning from China, just the speed at which they've adapted, managed some of the regulatory issues and really on a path for growth. Double down on what we're successful at, and we identified science as being a key one there. Voice of the patient and being patient-centric and being bold enough to challenge traditional models of care and innovation in the systems. So if you, we're going to move on to a coffee break now to come back here at five past four. But in the meantime, if we can thank the panelists, what I think has been a really engaging session. So thank you.